Hello, dear AITA listeners. I just wanted to point out a couple things about this episode. One, it's very, very weird. Um, This episode is basically a super inside baseball, which is to say insular discussion of a figure in the comedy scene in the United States. I guess I would say New York comedy scene named Seth Simons. Um, And Chandler is a listener of the show, a respected comedian and friend. And he voiced these opinions, and and I thought they were juicy. However, I am here to warn you, this is definitely not a normal guest episode. It's not a normal episode. This is basically a back and forth with Chandler giving his opinions on this person who uh, I think we both agree deserves a lot more nuance and grace and understanding. It's not really an endorsement on my behalf, but um, it is what it is. Uh, I'm mainly just saying this because like there's a very, very good chance you're going to be like, who is this guy and why should I care? And the answer is, I don't know and it doesn't matter. But if you're a comedian and you know who Seth Simons is, you might find it interesting. So that's it. That's the app. I hope you enjoy it. Again, thanks so much for listening to the show, and I'll see you next time. Hi, everybody. Welcome to an incredibly special, yes, people, I said it, incredibly special episode of Am I the Asshole Podcast. I am joined by New York comedian, PowerPoint god, humor writer, I dare say, one of the great humorists of our generation, or perhaps my brother's generation, I'm, I'm not really sure how old this guy is, Chandler Dean, welcome to the program. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Danny. And uh, I, I'm happy to be a Gen Z millennial cusp. Um, you know, I try to mm. have it both ways. We are going to talk today about a character. This is a unique thing we're doing, and, and I'm really excited. First of all, Chandler, thank you for going to my going away party. Um, you're gem and a half for attending. Um, I'm a, I'm a fan of yours. I look up to you in a lot of ways. You're, you're a very talented, uh, writer, um, very talented performer. And, uh, at my party, you soapboxed, I'm joking. You, uh, you espoused <laughs> an opinion that you are a Seth Simons, um, fan, right? Is that fair to say? Yes. Yeah. I'm a Seth Simons so, fan. I'm a Seth Simons apologist. I subscribe to the paid version of Seth Simon's newsletter. Uh, So that's about as big of a fan as you get, I think. So guys, and there's a reason here. Now this is very, very inside baseball, New York city comedy, maybe LA comedy to, to a good extent as well. But I want to bring you in on this because I actually think there is some things we can kind of extract from Seth Simon's role in the the comedy community. So I'll let you kind of take it Chandler. Like, Let's go into who is Seth Simons in the classical sense. You know, now we're in the newsletter. Seth Simon lives in Idaho era. But how did Seth Simons emerge? I mean, obviously, he was born of a man and a woman. I believe he wasn't created in a lab. But how how did he kind of become a voice initially in the comedy scene, a comedy journalist voice? So uh, my understanding uh, is that, you know, he started off uh, within, like, so now he identifies as like a comedy labor journalist that, you know, and there's comedy journalists and there's labor journalists. Uh, okay. and, but I don't think there's really anybody else who's doing exactly what he's doing, but where, how he started mm-hmm. was, um, he was sort of like any sort of vulture writer or, um, he wrote for uh, paste magazine, um, covering comedy. And, you know, when you're, when you work for one of those like online outlets, um, what you're doing is a lot of just like, Oh, like, this comedian deigned to give us an interview. We're going to give a really nice softball interview um, because right. it'll be good for our SEO to have this person on. And like, that's going to be it. It's going to be like, you know, did you have fun making this TV show or whatever? And that was right, the kind right, of stuff right. he started off writing. Because I think when he started, he was a, a vulture. To clarify for anyone listening, you're not calling him a vulture. Your vulture is just <laughs> sort of an indie comedy publication. So we're talking yes. about interviewing with maybe what you could say up and coming comedians, stuff like mm-hmm. that. You're who had just gotten a TV show and. You know, maybe the TV show goes somewhere and then they kind of benefit from being early or, or having this name on their records or, or in their in their publication, et cetera. Right. Yes. Um, and, you know, yeah, when I say vulture writer, like talking about that uh, outlet, um, I, I'm kind of using it to encompass like all forms of like comedy journalism that you see. I mean, there's just a whole subculture of journalism right now that's just like let's summarize the most recent episode of SNL that aired um, because that's what people want to click on on Sunday mornings. And so um, like he has personally admitted, like 
that that I, he has characterized the his early work that way in in sort of a, a disparaging way of like at first he was like just someone who was a fan of comedy someone who had done a little bit of comedy very briefly um and i think pivoted to like oh like i'm really more someone who wants to cover comedy um and at first it was very uncritical um but then right. i think where he came into the attention of a lot of people is when he started publishing um, independently and through just various outlets that would take his pitches, um, you know, like articles that kind of question the power structures in like specifically like local New York comedy. So not just like what the big institutions like SNL, which he has talked about, but literally like UCB, which is Upright Citizens Brigade, sketch and improv comedy theater that like you know, for most normal people have probably never heard of it, but like within comedy, specifically sketch and improv, like that was like the main like sketch and improv venue in New York. It was a feeder to SNL and other uh, comedy shows. And um, I think that's where he really like started catching people's attention was he had written some work that was uh, critical of UCB's practices. And um, well, that began a cycle of um, Seth Simons publishes something. Um, tons and tons and tons of comedians get really mad at him for criticizing the thing that they associate with. And in my view, the completion of that cycle um, is that by a couple of years later, everybody else has the same opinions as uh, Simons. And, you know, he's moved on to something else. Uh, but right. that, that's my view. I think he's good at calling those things out early when nobody else can. Yeah, I think I think because here's my perception of of Seth and I and I have to admit, I do feel a certain level of um, what's that word? Witch hunting going on. It's the Twitter <laughs> group mentality because I don't really know shit about him. And I, and I have written tweets roasting him, making fun of him uh, because I see that it's going right. I, I see this as a viewpoint that that friends of mine are espousing or maybe not friends, but, you know, colleagues in the comedy community and it's Twitter. So you, you see a perspective and you're like, oh, it's all bash on this guy. And, and I love that you you are I I, I got to I, I think I give you props. I give you props because I think a lot of people aren't eager to defend him. It's not the cool thing to do. And I think that's another fascinating thing about him is that my perception has been that he truly has really he's not on anyone's team and so even if he was uh ultimately purporting um kind of values that people support for instance ucb wasn't paying stand-up comedians i remember this being a controversial point I, I don't remember seeing people being like well he actually is right it was mainly just like f seth and then ucb came out and offered some kind of statement i mean are you, yeah, I don't remember all the details of this, but that's just yeah. kind of my neutral comedian who also kind of made fun of this guy. And honestly, I feel guilty now just coming clean with it because it was so uninformed of me. It was ignorant. Well, um, and I, I don't think that um, you're alone in this feeling of like jumping on the bandwagon, you know, just based on kind of, you know, because it's, it's so easy to uh, sort of have like a general take um, that's, that's going around and then everybody just kind of wants to riff on it for what it is. Um, so, uh, I, I certainly, there was a time, right? Like when, you know, so when he, when he, uh, you know, he published some pieces, um, basically saying like, it's not right that UCB doesn't pay their performers. It may be illegal that UCB doesn't pay their performers. And this is any of them, right? It's not just like, Yes, um, it came to a boil with stand-ups because stand-ups are used to getting paid at clubs. And so I think they were the first people right. to sort of protest this. Um, but right. then, like, literally, you could be, you know, on the most profitable weekend team, uh, you know, improv or sketch team at UCB. You could sell out shows every single week. Um, you could be, like, the main people on the website of UCB and still not get paid a dime. There's just no path to getting paid there. Um, and he basically just, like put a piece out being like, you know, they probably could pay their uh, performers. And if they can't pay their performers, then their business model is exploitative. And maybe like, you know, they have to kind of change the way that they do things. And I, I think it was a pretty fair criticism, but there was just a huge backlash at the time. And I think part of it was also that like part of his reporting was that there was like a meeting at, uh, with the founding members of UCB, including Amy Poehler, um, who where the few founding members met with a bunch of performers, like a you know like a hundred plus performers um, at the theater, and we're talking about these practices, and somebody like 
you know, who was familiar with Seth's work, like shared either a recording or like a summary of what happened at that meeting. So the reporting included some quotes and stuff from what was happening at the meeting. And I think that even if the criticism was, um, you know, something that other uh, comedians shared, the fact that this, you know, private meeting had information that ended up getting published, I think that's what a lot of people took issue with. Um, but mm. uh, it was so venomous and also just so lacking perspective about how journalism works because the fact of the matter is that if you have a meeting and one person records it, in New York, it's perfectly legal to record a meeting where only one party is consenting. And it's perfectly right. legal and often ethical for journalists to cover that if that information comes out because then it sheds light on the situation. But they were saying stuff like, Seth Simons doesn't understand our community. Seth Simons is just like, you know... Um, I think even then, like the, the one common criticism of Seth is, oh, he failed as a comedian and now he doesn't want to, um, you know, he just hates UCB or whatever. Like that narrative was coming from improvisers and sketch comedians before it came from stand ups. Um, and so that was the first time that I became familiar with his work. And like, I think at that time, I think I was kind of close to where you were, which was like, I didn't hate him and I didn't, um, you know, want to like seriously criticize him. But I was more than willing to like riff jokes about like, how Seth Simons is like UCB's arch nemesis or something like that. And just kind of add to right. the piling on without really like considering like, wait a minute, this is actually probably ultimately good um, and advocating for the performers, not trying to, you know, tear down their institution. Yeah. And I, I think a dynamic you pointed to, and this is what I think gets very interesting when we talk about, you know, there's obviously a, a tremendous leftist uh, lean in, in comedy in New York and New York City in general. And when we talk about criticizing the powers that be, uh, even UCB as relatively marginal in the world that it is, you know, comedians are, are basically out there, especially in New York City, struggling for scraps. You know, this is a city where I believe, and, and I might need to get fact check on this, but even the seller only pays something like 75 bucks a spot. But, but what was interesting to me was a dynamic that you pointed to, which is that people were unwilling to go with Seth because ultimately they viewed them themselves in this very kind of dangerous situation where if they were seen as criticizing the powers that be, then they would be fucked, right? Then they wouldn't yes. even get these, these kind of... Uh, I don't want to call them scraps, but relatively meager returns. But nonetheless, this is like meaningful amounts of money to people who are trying to make comedy their job. Yeah. And um, I think that uh, you only have to be given, especially in a structure, either, you know, like a comedy club or especially at UCB, where it's so hierarchical and like, you know, getting past at a club is like such a can feel like such a monumental achievement something that could take years and years to get to and so like right. you know you can start to feel like well yeah i don't have much but god like i would if if i fight for what i deserve i risk losing what little i've been given and this is exactly yes. the dynamic that club owners thrive from um is that right. they can count on the fact that there's countless comedians who um, will basically do anything uh, to perform, including sort of debase and devalue themselves. And, uh, right. you know, which is to say, like, I think it's, of course, like, you know, anybody who gets past at the comedy cellar, especially, like that is, you know, like that's so difficult to do. And it's like kind of the best that you can do. But um, I think a lot of what Seth's uh, points are in saying this, and, and he's actually tweeted some, some things recently to this effect of like, it's totally understandable that any one person wouldn't want to criticize the institution. And I think that the push is like, but, you know, if people were more willing to talk to each other and sort of grow a consensus and were willing to act together, just like people do in all other forms of labor, you know, in any right. other like industry where a union gets formed or where people use collective action to try to get something what they want, you know, if every single comedian, which isn't that many, who was passed at the comedy cellar all said, we're not going to perform until we get like X, Y, Z basic benefit or uh, cost. And by the way, like even using comedy cellar as an example, like, like that's probably not even the best example because there's so many other places that um, are do, are offering even less, you know, like places that don't, I don't know if Comedy Solo does this, but places that like offer like, you know, unpaid check spots. Well, that's bullshit. Like that's the worst spot on the night and you're not paying the performer to do it. You can certainly afford to do it. It's so just a weird power thing. So, you know, if all, let's say, I don't know how many people, a hundred plus people um, who are passed at a club all got together and said, you know what? We're not performing again until you pay check spots. 
the next day they'd be paying check spots. But if one person says it, they can just get blacklisted and the system continues as such. So that's the challenge. And it by no means is it easy, but like that's the lens through which I view Seth's work is like, he's the one guy um, who gives a shit, who has, uh, sh he's the one guy who has done two things. One, given a shit about the situation and two, divested himself of any right. kind of investment in the community. Right. He can have everybody hate him and it's fine because he's not trying to be a comedian. And then when that's what's so frustrating when people say like, oh, you failed as a comedian. So like, this is why you're doing this. Well, it's like, actually like you kind of need someone who has no chance of becoming a successful comedian to be the person who talks about these things because uh, you can't have skin in the game and be the one voice who's talking about that stuff. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think you're painting a great picture where, you know, Seth is ultimately just being a reporter. He's just reporting things that are, are given to him, information that's passed along to him. It leads to transparency. I'm sure he's not always right. And, and I don't think we're here to say that, you know, obviously these are complex issues running. A, it's not like comedy clubs are money printers. I mean, I, I certainly understand yeah. there's a balance of things. But in the end, it, it does seem, from from my perception at least, that comedians tend to be the group that's most consistently fucked here. You know, I I, I suspect that that is, that is largely true. Um, so, but but you said another thing earlier, which I want to add some meat to, which is that you know Seth has come out with these views, like for instance, that it's unfair that UCB doesn't pay performers. At the outset of this point, everyone sort of uh, oh fuck Seth. But then down the road, you're saying everyone was like, actually, he was he was right. Or maybe they didn't say he was right, but they came to espouse the very views that they they deemed him despicable for pointing out. That's exactly right. And I even think there's um, some cognitive dissonance where, like, there's plenty of people out there who would say it screwed up that UCB didn't pay performers. Like, it's clear from the way their business collapsed, you know, post pandemic that there was a lot of, you know, it revealed a lot about the structure of the place uh, that was just not working. Um, diversity concerns are also things that he's like written about that people have, you know, criticized UCB for not being representative enough. There's all kinds of, you know, like the internship at UCB being paid in class credit, but then that class credit not being redeemed for certain classes. Like <laughs> there's all kinds of weird. It's messed up, man. It's it's all yeah. so culty yeah, and weird. Is. And in retrospect, it's so obvious. So people will agree. Yes, all of those things are true. And then you ask, what do you think about Seth Simons? And they're like, he's a snake. And they don't even remember why they think he's a snake. Um, so I, I think there's a very different conversation happening with like, you know, the, now the stand-up community is, I think, the community that that places a lot of ire on Seth. And I would I would be remiss if I didn't mention that I think the uh, the the thing that brought him into the consciousness of the stand-up community was after yes. Shane Gillis got hired at Saturday Night Live. He posted a clip of Shane Gillis, um, and I, I think the caption was like. Uh, SNL just hired Bo and Yang, the first uh, Chinese American uh, cast member, and also this guy. Um, and then it was a clip of Shane Gillis, uh, you know, saying just in a po uh, like in a podcast talking about visiting Chinatown and you know using some uh, slurs and some uh, offensive voices or what have you uh, in that story. Um, that was it. He just posted the clip. I think the clip was behind a paywall for a podcast uh, uh, per our conversations about this previously. But nevertheless, it was yeah. still something that he had put out there for people to consume. Um, and so Seth just kind of posted that clip. And then that clip ended up leading toward um, a series of, you know, coverage from other people and, you know, responses from SNL that led to Shane Gillis. Um, you know, I, I don't know if he was actually fired or um, if he was asked to leave or however that worked. Um, but I know that he ended up releasing a statement saying, you know, I will not be on Saturday Night Live this season after that. And so a lot of people have um, since, you know, in the stand up community sort of viewed Seth Simons as like this cancel warrior who's like, oh, right, I'm going right. to like try to dig up um, offensive things you've said and ruin your career just at the moment that um, you've um, that you've that you've gotten an opportunity. Um, and all I, what I'll say on that and we can dig into it more or not, uh, but. What I'll say on that is that I know that a lot of times the way that Seth gets his um, stories is that people will just send him stuff like be like, right. hey, I saw this and I figured you might find it interesting. Someone sent him that clip of Shane Gillis. It's not like he went and he listened to a million Shane Gillis episodes. Someone who had heard it and I assume was hurt by it or just thought it was messed up, sent it to Seth. Seth said, this seems notable to me, posted it. And that was it. You know, he didn't fire Shane Gillis. 
Lauren Michaels fired Shane Gillis. Um, but I think that Seth has uh, received a lot of ire for that. You know, it may be true that if he had never posted it, that Shane Gillis would still be on SNL. But it may also be true that someone else would have found it. But he was the one to post it. He's gotten the backlash. And I think many people have never forgiven him for that. I just feel the need to mention that because I think anybody who's listening to this who doesn't like Seth Simons is probably going to point to that as the first thing that they think about when they think about him. Right, right. Um, Yeah, I mean, look, I think, first of all, I'll I'll gladly admit, you know, I think Shane Gillis is really funny, really talented comedian. I I love some of his sketches and bits. I I think it's pretty unambiguous that what he, you know, I don't think it's okay for paywall or not. I mean, certainly in our paywall, I'm not running around saying racial slurs, and I have kind of serious (laughs) questions about the culture and the community that you're sort of engaging with, if that's what's behind your paywall, I mean, good God. But I, I guess I do feel that this really does come back to transparency and, and ultimately that I, I do feel it is fair to hold Shane accountable for that. I think part of the controversy, I, I pulled up this quote here. Uh, it appears the tweet's been deleted, but Gillis responded on Twitter saying, I'm a comedian who pushes boundaries. I sometimes miss. If you go through my 10 years of comedy, most of it bad. You're going to find a lot of bad misses. I'm happy to apologize to anyone who's actually offended by anything I've said. My intention is never to hurt anyone, but I'm trying to be the best comedian I can. And sometimes that requires risks, um, which seems like a kind of not quite an apology. I, I don't know why he why he didn't just say like, oh, yeah, I'm sorry I said that. It was racist. And I, I normally don't joke like that because that's not my perception of him watching his other material it, it seemed actually like uh you know a particularly bad miss and not something that defines his comedy at all but i'm with you i mean why wouldn't he report on that it seems like a news story it seems relevant especially in a context where snl had only just recently hired this you know first featured player of asian descent thinking about that statement that, that shane released i mean i people People tend to talk about like, oh, like you have to be so careful nowadays. Like you can say one thing can ruin your whole career. And certainly you can say one terrible thing and get a lot of people really, really upset with you. But like, I don't know. I think there's also a huge contingency of people who love like a sort of a story of growth and who love to see people like uh, kind of change and and uh, recount for their actions. Um, and I, I do agree that like it just would have been so simple for Shane to issue, even if he didn't really believe it, just being calculated of like, oh, if I issue a heartfelt apology, like that will earn me a lot of points and maybe keep me my job. But, and then the specific phrasing was was really interesting to me. Um, you know, uh, I am happy to apologize to anyone who was actually offended. You don't need actually. Yeah. You could say, I'm happy to apologize to anyone who's offended. The actually to me implies that there's a belief that no one was actually offended. And that's why no right, apology right. was necessary, right? Um, there, it's, yep. it's, it's as if like everyone who's talking about this is not offended by this. Um, and I would say that is almost certainly not true. Um, and yeah, yeah, exactly. It's the juxtaposition. And, and to me, like when I first saw that tweet, obviously, you know, Shane Gillis is, is being criticized uh, by that tweet being shared. But I felt like it was almost more of a criticism of Saturday Night Live for trying to have it both ways, right? Like you can have a show that's like, hey, we talk about whatever and there's no boundaries and we're going to be offensive. And like that can be profitable. You can also have a show that's like, look at us. We're so diverse. We have these amazing breakthroughs, um, you know, in uh, like casting, you know, these these people who have been historically underrepresented. But if you try to do both at the same time, (laughs) you're going to have people pointing out that that's weird. And I really think that that was what was happening there. Um, And again, I think that. Um, if you're going to blame anybody, uh, you would blame Saturday Night Live because I would think that there's no way that SNL doesn't have somebody involved that doesn't that knows like maybe they didn't see that clip of Shane, but they probably know at the very least like, OK, like, you know, this guy is an edgy comedian. He's probably talked about something offensive before. We need to stand by him, you know, if this is what we're doing. But it was instead like we're going to hire him and then we're going to have a, a bad news cycle and then we're going to fire him like immediately for that. Like. If you are afraid of cancel culture, that's the thing you should be afraid of is the people in power that can actually decide whether someone keeps their job or loses it. So kind of no matter how you slice it, you know, if you think that it was just for him to leave, then obviously you're not mad at Seth Simons. If you think it's unjust for him to leave, 
you know, Seth is Seth is not the person who was ultimately responsible for uh, what played out. Um, yeah. So I, but and the other thing I'll say is that like most people who get cast on SNL, you know, get fired after like a season or two. It's a really hard show to break out of, and a lot of people yeah. just are featured players and never find their niche. Shane Gillis, I think, by the publicity that he got from this whole controversy has ended up probably getting more attention and more, um, you know, more of a career, perhaps, than if he had actually lasted a season on the show. Because if you look at someone like, I don't know, Brooks Whelan, you know, that guy's got like a $50 a month Patreon podcast, I lo- which I like, by the way. But, like, he's struggling. Um, so is, like, Luke Knoll and other people who were only on the show for one season. So, like, I don't know. Uh, this idea of like Shane Gillis's career was ruined by this. I think there are plenty of people who have circled the wagons around him. Um, so yeah, there's just a lot of angles from which it doesn't really hold up to say like that, that Seth Simons did something that was unforgivable here. Well, yeah. And I, I think it feeds into your earlier point, which is who's easier to dunk on. Let's yes. all dunk on, on the messenger here, which is Seth. When really this is the power structure of SNL, but we don't want to shit on SNL and write negative tweets about Lauren Michaels or, or whoever, because, well, I'm trying to be on SNL. I'm trying to get in the writer's thing or, or whatever it may be. Yeah. And by the way, like SNL is sort of like a bigger version of the comedy club problem. And it's it's hilarious because like, OK, what are there like? probably like 10,000 comedians at any given time, like in the United States, like it's some insane number, right? And every year SNL hires like three people. And I just think there's so (laughs) many people, like you will, you, the listener, you, whoever, like the royal you, most, the vast majority of people, like you're more likely to get XYZ rare disease than you are to uh, get on <laughs> SNL. Your chances go from 0.001 to zero if you like stand up for something you believe in to criticize them. Like, the, it, is that really not a worthy trade? But so many people have this, like, I think because all comedians, myself included, are like have like this complex where they believe they're the main character of life and that they're inevitably going to get everything that they want if they just work hard enough. Like that that makes them afraid to criticize this comedy institution. And yes, it's very powerful, but at the same time it's like, wow, that's not you didn't have to get offered much of a carrot to shift your principles, um, you know, if that's all it takes. A one in 10,000 shot at getting on SNL is what's stopping you from uh, being critical of it. And look, even right now, as I'm saying this, I'm like, man, this is probably a mistake. <laughs> but yeah. I, but literally, like, but, but it's so irrational because, like, I wasn't going to get on SNL yesterday. I'm not going to get on SNL today. I won't get it after this is posted. Um, and if I feel like I can criticize it, uh, then I don't know. Then what I gain from that is just, like, a, a lot more of an ability to kind of just stand for what I think is right. Um, and that won't get me anything either, you know, (laughs) either way, I'm not getting a job. Uh, but this feels better to me, I guess. Yeah. I mean, look, I'm afraid too. I'm, I'm afraid of, uh, you know, even entertaining a defense of Seth or publicly criticize. I I don't, I don't really think we're being very critical of Shane. We're just kind of going over what happened. I think we've done a pretty fair job of doing it, but the, the problem is, and I think the fear come, that comes with this and why I think it, it was cool and ultimately, dare I say, brave for you to espouse these views and to be willing to talk about it is because uh, beyond beyond the normal kind of comedians like me who are like Seth haters or Seth dunkers on Twitter, uh, I believe I've deleted any tweet because I was like, why am I doing this? I don't even I don't even know enough about this situation. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm, I'm just hating to hate. Uh, but, but Seth has, uh, you know, raised tremendous ire from um, I, I don't even really want to name the groups, but people have, let's just say, harassed him and, and possibly even compromised his physical safety. You know, they they threw this kind of comedy festival in Idaho and it was seemingly directed at him, you know, which obviously made him afraid. And these are kind of people who have, uh, you know, leveled a lot of hateful statements on him on Twitter. That, is that right? Yeah, definitely. The Idaho Comedy Festival, um, the initial poster had like literally a caricature of Seth Simons uh, on it. Um, And it took place in the town that he was staying. And by the way, the reason he was there was because he was visiting a friend uh, when the pandemic first hit 
and he has some kind of like autoimmune disorder that like makes him particularly at risk to COVID. So he's like stayed there ever since. And I think is probably coming back to Brooklyn now that he's been vaccinated, but like was stuck in Idaho for a year basically, um, which is nuts. Um, and yeah, I mean, people have made fun of him for that. Like people have just like taken every sort of low thing that you could say about a person and said it about him. And like, when you look at like the evidence of just like, this is just a guy who writes articles every once in a while being like, hey, this is kind of racist or hey, this is like not a good labor practice. It's like if nothing that he's doing is actually, um, you know, I, OK, fine. You want to argue that Shane Gillis's career was hurt by Seth sharing that post? Fine. You know, uh, I still think anyone else could have done it. But let's give you that. There, there's not really anyone else who um, demonstrably like has anything in their life changed because Seth is posting these things. He's just reporting and like he doesn't he's got, you know, a decently like a niche following. But like this is not like headline news that that's being made. It's just like a criticism. And to me, when I see like this level of response to this sort of measured of a criticism and just the occasional tweets like being kind of snarky, like it shows like, wow, these people um, who again, yeah, we should naming specific people would probably be a mistake uh, <laughs> in terms of getting harassed. Um, but these people, like, they clearly can't accept any form of criticism without going fucking bananas. Because um, if this is what's like, you know, driving them nuts, imagine if like, you know, they became famous and then like the New York Times, you know, found something about them or whatever. Like how big of a backlash would they get? Well, actually probably less because they know they can't bully the New York Times into stopping what they're doing. Um, the only reason that they're willing to attack Seth is because they're not afraid of him uh, in the sense of that structural thing. And if they're not afraid of him, then why do you have to be so uh, defensive? It, it just doesn't, right. like, all of it is just so petty and so weird. And again, it's like, there is like a pick on someone your own size sort of uh, like dynamic here where it's like, they would never, if Jason Zinneman, who's the um, New York Times reporter, Jason Zinneman posted the same sort of article that Seth Simons did, you would not have that same level of ire because those people are still probably hoping like, oh, maybe I could get a good feature in the New York Times if I play my cards right. They have too much to gain. And so then that cowardice would come right back. They know that Seth Simons is never going to write a glowing profile of them or give them a job. So then they can be, you know, they can uh, attack him and dox him and, you know, say all of these and cruel things about him and all of that. Yeah, and, and and that is why ultimately, you know, I, I I don't know that I'm ready to pay for the Seth Simon newsletter, but I, <laughs> I think you've painted a, a very fair picture here. And I, I look, I don't think the guy is doing this for any reason other than he's the one who's doing it. He feels a you know a calling to do it to report on these things, which are definitely problems, even if you are on on Shane Gillis's side and you think cancel culture is overblown which I I don't think most people at this point would say that 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 this is a symptom of overblown cancel culture um you know and, and even so I think it could have been handled differently etc but even even if you're not really on Seth Simon's side and you don't agree with what he's doing because of all the nuances of these situations Considering the ire he has received and the harassment and all of this, he is ultimately trying to put put truth out there. And on the issue of AITA for being Seth Simons, I got to say, I kind of leaning he's the hero. And I'm not endorsing <laughs> everything he's done, but I got mad respect for anyone willing to speak truth to power. Uh, I think that uh, the, the nail being hit on the head is that he does not really have almost anything to gain from doing right. this. He would have a lot more to gain from continuing to do what he did before, which is like, I'm going to interview, you know, this person who's promoting a movie and just ask really fun questions and like, that I'm ingratiating myself with the powerful and I'm getting a nice little paycheck uh, from, you know, a mainstream publication, you know, he's instead like making a little newsletter from scratch that I think maybe is barely enough for him to pay his rent now, but in exchange, like he's the most hated man in the comedy world. Um, and so like, yeah, th it doesn't really hold water. The idea of like, oh, he's doing this to enrich himself or like, he's just profiting <laughs> off of like the, but people really believe this. This is the crazy part. Um, and so, yeah, uh, I would agree. Um, again, like is, 
ever like and this is this is the difference right is that people will 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 find like one or two things that that really bother them about him um and, and stick to that so yeah like it's possible that at some point he tweeted something that wasn't fair or some point he you know made wrote an article that was a little more snarky than it had to be to make the point that it did uh i personally enjoy the snarkiness but i understand people who don't nevertheless though um, snarkiness alone does not make someone an asshole, so I would agree. Um, I don't know if he's the hero is an official category, but certainly NTA, not the asshole, is my view. Love it. Well, thanks for going into that. I think uh, I think it's an interesting thing to talk about, you know, and especially in a polarized political landscape. You know, I'm always trying to urge people toward nuance. I mean, and I, I just think nuance is important. And I think ultimately, Seth Simons is facilitating that and facilitating transparency. So uh, thanks for having the guts to talk about this. And hopefully we are not, uh, you know, I, I guess we wouldn't be canceled for this, but we could be attacked by various uh, sorted <laughs> groups. So hopefully yes. that doesn't happen to us. Yeah, um, I, I that's that's the one thing that I am uh, concerned about. But yeah, I, I I agree. Like I think that this is, I mean, it's just it's gonna be it's gonna be rough. But you know, the thing is, is that I think they're very easily distracted. So I think it's probably twenty four hours of us being the people that they attack. But then you know they'll sniff blood in the water elsewhere and move away. Um, I think Seth Simons is always gonna be the main character of their ire, um, and and random defenders uh, not so much. Um, but this is this is the task because I know that you were talking about you know making this the title of the app uh, and I think it will get you attention. But the question is, are more people name searching Seth Simons because they are fans of his work, or are they name searching Seth Simons because they're looking for the next people to attack? Um, I have a bad feeling, but you know what? Uh, if they listen this far, you know. Uh, and they still want to attack. I guess they've uh, made their bed. Uh, go, go right ahead. Give me your worst. Just please uh, don't dox my family. All right. Just dox me if you have to, but not the family. Yeah, that that is how far it has gone with him. Is that people have released the personal information of his family? Yes, his parents. Like it's really, um, <laughs> it's it's so screwed up. Um, and again, like the size of the reaction compared to the size of the um, p supposed infraction is, uh, you know. It's it's disproportionate would be my take. Uh, but I think we've gotten away without I think what would really get us in trouble is if we name checked a specific person or a specific group and said that that group was racist or sexist. And certainly there are racist or sexist people out there, but we haven't named any of them. So maybe that will be enough uh, to keep us from uh, from getting attacked. And there you go. See, I'm not saying 100 percent of what I would like to say, because I know what the consequences will be. This is right back to the argument for why Seth Simons is NTA. And I am. <laughs> I mean, uh, to I'm not going to call that out. The, the fact that we're not willing to do it and I and already my heart is racing a little bit. My palms are sweating <laughs> makes me have all the more respect for Seth because <laughs> what he's doing is not sexy. It's not really particularly profitable. It is extremely niche. And yet he continues to do it despite harassment, despite very tangible and scary things that have happened. And, you know, respect where it's due. <laughs> like yeah. I, I gotta respect that. I don't have the guts. I don't have the gut. What do they call this? A w it's almost like a whistleblower. Yeah, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm not. I'm not blowing any whistle. I, I'm like just <laughs> walking away from that whole thing. You know, he's got he's got balls. He does. He's got he, guts. He does. He really does. Uh, so mad respect to that. And uh, yeah, I um I hope I hope I can uh, develop uh, similarly sized balls at some point in my life uh, because uh, that would be I could be proud. Uh, but for now, uh, I will just have medium sized balls to say I enjoy his work. <laughs> That's as far as I can go. Love it. Love it. All right. We're just going to do one situation here kind of along these notes. Thanks. Thanks again for joining me, Chandler. I, I got mad respect for you for being a Seth Simons apologist. Here we go. AITA for writing out my assistant slash colleague and getting her fired to save my own job. I've worked at my current employer for 30 years, 30 M. Last year, March 2020, I received a promotion to project manager. At the beginning, things went well. But in the last month, I'm getting more and more negative feedback. I didn't understand what was going on or why people were becoming so negative about me. I was losing clients, and several colleagues were really upset with me. I was at a loss. I started talking to my manager and my department head about following courses, getting monthly feedback to perform better. I just wanted to live up to the promotion I received. I felt like I was failing. 
Then a friend, colleague, 27F, of mine came to me angry and demanded that I apologize for what I said. I was confused and asked her why she was upset. She explained she received an email where I was basically blaming her for the issues that I was dealing with. This was an email a client forwarded her. I was at a loss and I explained I never send out an email like that and if she could show me. She did. It had my name, my send address, and everything seemed like it was from me, but I didn't send it. Then it clicked. My assistant, 39F, has access to my email and has the ability to send as me. She's the only one that has these rights. I was flabbergasted and so much started to make sense. She was next in line for my job and didn't receive the promotion. I did. I checked all her sent mail on her PC while she was out for lunch and saw dozens of emails sent as if they were from me. An email still open on her screen showed my email address and a written message to clients with misinformation, passive aggressiveness, and straight up lies. These were sent out under my name. I made screenshots and sent them to myself, then went to my manager and the head of the department. They were pissed. She was fired that same day. I was relieved and all my colleagues were informed. I thought I was completely in the right here, but some people at work are complaining I violated company policy for snooping on her PC and violating her privacy. My boss and direct colleagues have my back, but the people that knew her, she's worked there since 2011 and I've been there since 2018, say I went too far. Apparently, she's a single mother with two kids and needed the job. I also need the job. And she was more than willing to sacrifice me for her benefit. I don't see how I could be in the wrong for defending myself. Maybe I'm just too close to the situation. Did I go too far by going on her PC? A-I-T-A. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, You know, okay. Should I just share my, like, initial gut instinct here? Go for it. Okay. So, I feel like, certainly, uh, this person, uh, the, uh... The assistant is an asshole, obviously, uh, for uh, lying and impersonating uh, her uh, boss, I guess. Um, and yeah, it's also like I, there's it's unclear to me, like what could possibly be the justification for why this person is doing this? That's one thing I feel like is not here, right? Is like where's an explanation from the assistant as to why she was doing these things? It's, it's pretty crazy. Um, right. So I would say like – I, I can see why people would be upset about her going on and violating uh, privacy to begin with because the thing – the fact of the matter is you don't know 100 percent yet uh, what this person has done. Obviously, you're vindicated when you see like they've been doing this screwed up thing and then you can report it. Um, but you know I can understand why people wouldn't want you to cross that boundary. I guess my feeling is – Um, that the best way to approach the situation might have been to present the information you have to your boss and like, I don't know if her boss would have access to everyone's emails to be able to confirm such a thing or if there was a way to like have a mediation to discuss this or ask the um, assistant to uh, consent to share these things. Um, It feels like that might have been the best way to approach it. But just because she didn't do the best thing doesn't mean that she's an asshole. Um, that, that's kind of where I'm – oh, I'm sorry. He. Sorry. I, I don't know why I thought uh, that the, uh, OP was a woman. Um, but anyway, yeah, he uh, he's not an asshole for um, like not doing the best thing. I think it was maybe a little bit not the ideal approach. Um, so like I could be persuaded a little bit. But, like, the size of the crime, which is, like, just totally, like, a career-annihilating potential thing to do, um, I think makes the means pretty justified of doing it. Um, Right. But I don't know. I I can understand the people being upset. I think ultimately, though, um, you know, it was just, like, not the best way to approach it, but uh, still valid given the circumstances. Yeah, I I mean, I think this is a common thing that people kind of run from, which is like, oh, well, the consequences were bad. She's a single mother. How could you do that to her? And it's like, well, hold on a second. OP didn't do that to her, right? It's kind of, this does go back to the the Seth Simons thing where it's like, well, no, he's just reporting. That was just a fact. You know, it's, how are you going to be mad at someone for reporting a fact? If it's true, it's true. That's not on OP. That This is ultimately, yeah. that's her responsibility. She did something. So really what you, you should be saying is how could she do this and endanger her uh, endanger her financial livelihood and put her two kids' well-being at stake yeah. through this, you know, kind of petty maneuver? That's, that's ultimately how this feels to me is that she was very hurt or whatever by not getting promoted. And so she's kind of taking shots in this, this weird... Uh, way 
Um, it, regarding what he actually did, I, I think you're right. There's probably a better way to do it, but I can see how the adrenaline will get high here because, like, yeah. look, I, I don't know exactly how this is implemented from a technological perspective, but this does seem like something you want to nip in the bud ASAP and get your record straight. Yeah. OP knew it was going down. He knew he didn't write the emails. So I would I would say to make an analogy, it's very much like uh, what do they call that? Uh, probable cause. Like he knew, right. he knew someone else had to author the email. She was the only person that could have done it. So like yeah, he broke company policy, but he had to get this evidence before she could delete it or whatever. Yeah. Because if there's any ambiguity there, then he becomes again vulnerable. So I, I pretty much understand, you know, what what he did. It makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, I, I, I'm pretty much with you on that. Uh, yeah, because it's easy to imagine, like, if he did do it the right way, report to the boss, talk about it, call the person in for a meeting. Um, assistant could easily, you know, cover up any evidence that this happened. Um, and then, yeah, you'd be right back in the situation where, you know, for all that he knows, like, his boss could end up not believing him and saying, like, well, you've just accused this person of this crazy thing with no evidence. And if it's um, if there's no evidence of it and you actually are the one sending these emails, then you're like double screwed, um, you know, because you right. both look like a liar and you uh, are being accused of writing these, you know, very unprofessional emails. Yeah, exactly. And you never you really never want to be in a situation where it's your word against someone else's word. I mean, this is yeah. a very there's really no reason then at that point to believe you, especially when more is at stake for you and your name is on the emails like that would be a nightmare sitch i guess like the only other thing that you could do and you pretty much have to be a saint to approach it this way um but i suppose you could have gotten the evidence and then talked to the person and said maybe without even showing the evidence like i know you've been doing this why are you doing this and try to find a way to talk it through i again like i guess like if i'm really stretching here i'm like you know for a person to do this, they have to be in a really dark place, you know? So it could be that there's some insane circumstances that have just driven this person mad, I guess, and that maybe there could be an empathetic approach. But at the same time, again, every moment that you wait to report this kind of thing, you know, um, the more you put yourself at risk for the other person to, you know, has, as they've already shown a willingness to do, you know, put your own uh, life in jeopardy. So again, uh, yeah, that, that would be my my thing is like, it, I 100% understand the approach he took. It's, I can envision as a third party better ways to approach it or more empathetic ways to approach it. But ultimately, she's responsible, the assistant, for her own actions. Um, and this is pretty egregious. I mean, this is different from like, you know, somebody makes a joke that you're uncomfortable with and you like immediately report it. Like, this is like uh, an action that where no justification, no explanation um, could make it okay. You could, there could be mitigating factors, but nothing that would be like, oh, I totally understand this, and like uh, this person can continue to work here. Uh, they're a danger to their coworkers. Absolutely, absolutely. Christmas eight fifty says you didn't get her fired. She did this to herself. Someone would have figured it out eventually. She chose to risk her job and endanger the business with her deceit. Losing her position is a natural consequence of her choices. NTA. I think that's kind of where I fall on this. And I think a value I find myself espousing, even though I feel like it sounds conservative, but responsibility is a big one. You got to just take ownership over that shit yeah. you did. It doesn't make you a bad person. You did a bad thing. You know, that's it. So you did a bad thing. We all fuck up and you do better next time, you know? Yeah, I really think like and, and uh, the friends are also kind of the asshole here for just like you know, circling the wagon around her and, and not, um, not being willing to accept like, you know, uh, that she had done something wrong. Like maybe you can be mad at him a little bit or maybe upset that your, your, your friend is not there anymore or empathetic to her situation. I, I certainly don't think like, let's say you're her friend and this happens to her. I think it would be fine to like go to her and talk to her and like try to help her out and get back on her feet. That's okay. But to blame the guy, uh, for just, you know, finding out the truth, uh, is, you know, it, it, it is pretty unfair. So yeah. Um, my inclination is to say, uh, and I don't know, you know, if you're the one who has to, uh, put down the gauntlet here, but my inclination is to say, um, uh, NTA and, uh, the assistant is, and also even the friends of the assistant are. 
Yeah, I think that's an interesting point to go into and use this phrase. I don't actually know. What is circling the wagon? What is that supposed to mean? I'm making sure that I'm not uh, getting it wrong here, but I think circling the wagons means like just like protecting someone um, even after they've done something that is like, uh, you know, wrong um, and like putting yourself on the line for someone who has done something messed up uh, and just like protecting them um, at all costs. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's a toxic thing, you know, it's because it, it really does go back to responsibility and like not not really understanding and just being honest and ready to confront your friend. And a real friend will do this. A real friend will say like, yo, dude, I, I love you, but you fucked up here. You know, it's not actually true friendship to be like, oh, you didn't do anything wrong. It's unfair. It's like, no, you got to call them on the carpet and they might hate you for that. But ultimately, that is how you grow as a person when your friends call you on your bullshit. That's a, that's a great way to remain stuck. And also, this woman is, uh, what, 39 years old, this assistant? I mean, you know, like, again, I think there's always mitigating factors. And if this was, like, you know, some 23-year-old kid, then maybe you could see, like, I don't know, like, they're young and stupid. Uh, but this person's had a career for this long. They say, oh, she's worked here for so long. Well, if you've worked there that long... You should know better uh, than to go around doing this, uh, frankly, uh, I mean, I don't want to use any ableist terms. I was going to say psycho, but that probably wouldn't be fair to say. But I would say just a uh, really, really uh, bad and wrong thing to do. Um, and yeah, so I think that she, she's got the consequences that match the, um, the actions that she took. Um, I think that, again, like... Uh, in the in the general like snitches get stitches argument i do think that like if someone does some does or says something that's like a little bit off kilter or that makes you a little bit uncomfortable you know that's when i think it's um more appropriate to try to work that out with that person and see if they're willing to be contrite without bringing in management um you know or if someone violates a company policy but it's not hurting anybody oh they wore you know shorts to work or like oh they're always showing up late or whatever but it doesn't affect anything else like that is, I think, wrong. But reporting on someone for doing something that's tangibly hurting you and hurting the reputation of the company, by the way, um, it's yeah, not just him. Absolutely. It's like it, people read this and they're like, oh, they really are hiring some assholes here at this company. Um, that hurts a lot of people. You could lose a client and then suddenly she might get laid off anyway. Um, yeah. <laughs> so like there's all kinds of things that could happen from doing this. It needed to be stopped. Um, and it's, a, it's an unambiguously good thing that she stopped working for that company company if that's what she was doing. Yeah, I mean, the only defense I could mount of her is that, you know, she's been there for a while and she, you know, she might be in a toxic workplace. We don't know the context. OP doesn't seem like a bad dude, but maybe she's just really frustrated because of some sexism or, you know, maybe just right. less, maybe not full blown sexism, but she's treated in such a way that's like she feels marginalized and it's very painful for her and she's not advancing in her career. And that might be due to internal biases and stuff like that. But she ultimately endangered the job of a specific individual and wasn't able to, you know, really kind of fight truth to power if that's, if that's really what this was made of. And that also could fall on the company. Mm. So we don't know all that, but that's, that would be the best I could do at defending her is that she felt unable to channel uh, her emotions into a good a good way or, or maybe even just it really wasn't possible maybe there's not a proper HR department or whatever right and so she was just like oh let me bring this one guy down because it's all I can really think to do um, but you know he doesn't yeah. deserve that either I, it's I not think, his fault right no certainly I, I would say like um, you know looking at it from that perspective the one thing like if the bosses could have maybe done is like, I don't know, I don't know if a if a suspension or like a probation thing or like having some kind of like mediation of like, why did you do this? What's happening here? Like maybe a little bit more investigation for just before just immediately firing someone. Um, but that's the tricky thing is that like, if there is such a thing uh, as an immediately fireable offense, um, getting on an account and impersonating someone else and saying damaging things like that is pretty harsh. I mean, short of showing up to, you know, short of like showing up to work naked <laughs> or like hurting, you know, like hurting someone at work. Um, I, I, it's hard to think of much else that would be more clearly an immediately fireable offense. Um, but yeah, if I had to be like, take a more empathetic view on her side, that's what I would say is, you know, 
like maybe the bosses could have taken a little bit more time to, you know, g get her perspective. And if her perspective is like, I hate this guy and that's why I did it. It's like, great, you're fired. That's not a good enough reason. Uh, there right. probably is no good enough reason. Well, I mean, I, I like I like the idea of, you know, workplaces and businesses and, and really, you know, everything just taking a very human approach to things recognizing that people do make mistakes and trying to understand why people make those mistakes. I think it's really important, you know, and, and, and I think that there could be more like humanistic approaches to running a business and making sure that people feel understood and taking the time to understand them, you know, cause I would want to know, I'm like, well, why would you really do this? What's, what's going on? You know, like, I, I, I don't know if that's possible really or appropriate. I, I, there might be some like, you know, uh, what's the word I want? Like liability or something, but God just taking mm -hmm. the time to understand why, why did this go down? Cause look, this person was with them for 10 years, right? Since 2011. And it's like, I, yeah. I want to know, I want to know why she self-sabotaged here, you know, and, and we should, I, I think businesses should try to keep their people and try to understand their people and work with their people. And, not be so punitive and because look i think we talked a little bit about redemption and i think redemption is very powerful and forgiveness is very powerful i mean a lot of patrons yeah. on the show uh began to actually like me and connect with me after i was called out for statements i made i was called the fuck out and i own that shit and i apologize and, I, and i'm working at getting better every single day still fuck up and, uh, mm. you know, it can really, and I really feel in a friendship, for instance, if, if you fuck up and then, oh, hey man, you fucked up and you hurt me. Oh, I'm sorry. I did that. That, that brings you closer. That bring, that creates yes. the first bridge of trust. Cause you're like, look, if something else goes wrong, we, we can process it. We did it once. We'll do it again. So maybe there's something yeah. to be said on that note. Nonetheless, I think we are in alignment here. AITA for riding out my colleague and getting her fired to save my own job. I think we agree wholeheartedly, not the asshole, and she is, and possibly her friends as well, for circling the wagon. A rare crime, but Chandler <laughs> Dean is... Chandler, thank you so much for joining me. This has been uh, a blast. My palms are sweating. I'm like, am I going to edit this? Oh, my God, I'm going to freak out, but... Look at the end. This, this. You, have to, you put it behind several paywalls. Uh. <laughs> Maybe I'll put it behind my, my paywall first to see what the patrons think. And then if, if any of them are like, yeah, just watch out or whatever. We'll see a little <laughs> testing ground. <laughs> Um, but the, yeah, here's what we'll do. We'll put it behind your paywall. And then if that goes well, we can reach out to Seth Simons and say, Hey, do you want this content behind <laughs> your paywall? And we just keep putting it behind friendly paywalls until we actually reach a mass audience. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Chandler, you're an immensely <laughs> talented dude. I uh, really appreciate having you tell these guys where they can find you Twitter shows, anything you want to plug. Well, first of all, um, I would be remiss if I uh, did not uh, share my mutual appreciation for you. Uh, you said some very kind things uh, there at the beginning of the show about me. And I want to say, man, I am so impressed by not just your hustle, but the quality within your hustle, the podcasts, the TikToks, the Twitter, the YouTube. You've like, you like go from platform to platform and like dominate it and say, okay, now what? I'm going to go dominate another one. So, uh, so much funny stuff. And I always love seeing everything that you post. And, uh, I, I see you like, just like your sheer like productivity and the quality of work. And I'm like, okay, I got to step up my fucking game. That's how I feel. So, um, you're putting tears in my that. eyes. Uh, you're putting tears in my eyes, sir. <laughs> I really appreciate that. I really do. You, des you deserve all the best. Uh, you deserve the instant fame that everyone who moves to L.A. Um, deserves. <laughs> uh, you, you deserve it even more. Um, but uh, anyway... Um, I'm at Chandler J. Dean on all social media. I'm on, uh, YouTube at, uh, Chandler Dean videos. Um, and I'm trying to think, yeah, I mean, I have like articles on, uh, satire sites all the time. Uh, so if you follow me on Twitter, I'm always posting those. Um, yeah, those are the main, uh, things, uh, that I'd like to plug. Um, yeah. And, uh, yeah, follow me and, uh, flame me for all of the things that I've said on this podcast. As long as you follow me first, it, I'll feel happy about it. You also have a really cool domain name, chndlr.com. That's you love to see that. That's cool. It's Chandler with no vowels. Um, I'm very proud to have gotten it. Um, I think someone else wanted it and then tweeted about like, who the fuck is this guy that has Chandler.com? Um, and uh, yeah, I, I felt good that I got there first. 
It says right here, comedian and speechwriter, folks. Featured in the New Yorker, WAPO, McSweeney's, Reductress, Hard Drive, and now, Am I the Asshole Podcast. By the way, final thing. <laughs> Final thing is that Chandler, you guys know how I always put the thing, skip guess the verdict, skip Danny Juice. Chandler is a skipper, and it made me so happy because I was like, Am I, does anybody actually skip? And you are a skipper. And I was like, yes, my work is worth it. Yes, yes. I know that some people are offended by the skippers, and I think that it's great no. that you've embraced the skippers. You know, there's no wrong way to listen to a podcast. And yeah, I'll read the title, and I'll be like, I want to hear about what's in the title, or like, I just want to get to the situations, um, because, you know, X, Y, Z reasons. And um, sure. luckily this time, uh, I mean, we get straight into it, really. If you're here for Seth Simons, that's the bulk of what we do. Uh, you've probably stopped listening by this point. You're like, I don't want the situation. <laughs> but anyway. Yes, uh, I, I'm very proud to be a skipper, and I appreciate you for putting the um, little uh, timer for me to click on or to skip to to uh, hear the situation. Skippers, no skippers. I embrace everybody, and I, I hope you enjoyed the app, and it was great to have Chandler. Follow him on social media, and we'll see you guys next time. Bye.